you unleash a patient on the internet, on Google, and they can search on them, how are they even able to assess? Is, is a $245 platform test better than a $45 one or a $100 one? Like what is that? What is this price equal uh, efficacy? Uh, there were even some claims that uh, the AMH was evaluating the delayed onset of male puberty. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, we've asked these research questions of the, the AMH in, in the male uh, uh, space, but this is not ready for prime time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of My Fertology. And today we're going to talk about AMH and fertility, and we're really discussing at-home testing. A research just came out, so we are super thrilled that we're going to bring on Dr. Barat, Ari Barat, from Great Fertility Clinic Center, actually, and uh, we are live. So he, just so you know a bit, a little bit about his background, we want to get dive deep into this discussion with his expertise because he is a fertility doctor, and uh, let me share a little bit about who he is. He has been dedicated to women's health and reproductive medicine for over 20 years. He's one of the select few physicians in Canada with accreditation and the advanced level of training required to care for people dealing with infertility and recurrent miscarriages. So we're just waiting for him to log on because um, he's having a little bit of tech issues, but that's okay. We're going to just dive in even before he shows up. So Tanya, do you want to explain maybe what AMH testing is? Then, then Dr. Brass doesn't even have to share that, right? Yeah, sure. So AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone, which means it's a hormone. And you can get your levels tested via blood work when you go to an Ontario Life Labs or Gamma Dynacare, one of our local Ontario labs, and it gives you an idea of what your ovary reserve is. So that means like, you know, how many eggs do you have left? Basically, if let's say you're an older woman and you're trying to decide what kind of treatments to do, if you're kind of late in the game, starting to get pregnant or trying to get pregnant, or perhaps you're younger and uh, you haven't even considered fertility is on the table um, yet. And you just want to kind of get a sense of where you're, you are at. We're actually going to ask Dr. Barats his opinion on that because apparently we do, uh, you know, the North American Menopause Society does caution um, getting AMH tested in younger women for a fertility screen. Um, and it's especially controversial in women younger than 25 years old. However, it can also be used for um, women uh now, as of the guidelines, the polycystic ovary syndrome guidelines, um, American ones do say that you can use anti-malarian hormone to, to see if perhaps a woman has polycystic ovary syndrome. It's part of the Rotterdam criteria. You would look at two of three factors, um, one being uh, irregular menstrual cycles. Uh, a woman might have uh, that where their periods are less than 21 days apart or more than 35 days apart combined with oh uh, sorry some sometimes not bleeding at all right so yeah or not bleeding at all that's right yeah. so amenorrhea which means like no ovulation no periods so irregular periods uh, or amenorrhea combined with one of the other factors which could be pelvic ultrasound or amh now so you can use amh instead of a pelvic ultrasound pelvic ultrasound might show lots of follicles on the ovaries which usually indicates a more PCOS presentation or bulky ovaries, or perhaps uh, the follicles are kind of more clustered around the outside, looking like a pearl necklace, they say, on an ultrasound. But for younger women, perhaps they don't want to have an internal pelvic ultrasound. So AMH can be used now as that second uh, potential criteria for the Rotterdam um, assessment or the, the diagnosis of PCOS. And then the third finding would be that androgen excess, which you might see clinically or on blood work. Uh, so, you know, it's nice to have an extra test like the, hello, Dr. Ratz, uh, the AMH uh, test to diagnose PCOS. Um, but I will, um, you know, let Dr. Bratz take over a little bit. We were just talking about what is AMH even and uh, 
before we get into like kind of the controversial at home testing and how to get it tested. Um, or maybe Mary, you might want to lead the way here because here I am answering the question and then asking Dr. Bratz to keep <laughs> going. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I guess, you know, let's, let's begin by saying that, you know, typically at a fertility clinic, that's, that's what they do, but now they're offering it at home. So we definitely want Dr. Barras to weigh in on this, like, you know, the pros and cons. And um, I think we all looked at the research so we can actually tell everybody what the heck this research is and what, what their findings are. And so I'll, I'll let Dr. Burnett lead the way. So we know what AMH is now. We talked about the anti-malarian hormone and how we can take a blood test to check our fertility. So Dr. Burrats, what are, it was your insight. Okay, I guess we should discuss the research first. Did you get a chance to look at it? Sure. Well, let, let's, let's unpack a few things here. So the first thing is, just to be very clear, if you were to Google AMH, two big items pop up. AMH is a, a classical hormone that you learn about in early embryology that is one of these early switches that allows women, gen, gen, um, genetic women to become and express their women reproductive parts. So at it, early in life, you actually want it to be low. But then later in life, um, when the embryology piece is completed, a AMH has emerged as a what we call a biomarker. So it's supposed to represent something. Uh, and we believe it represents in its most pure form uh, a secretory product from the granulosa cells of viable eggs. And that that is correlated with how large the egg pool or egg bank that is available for fertility treatments. Fertility treatments are typically accessed by men and women go that are having issues with fertility or infertility. So that's really where the origin, the genesis of it came from was one of these markers, a part of a, a group of markers that we use to evaluate what is called ovarian reserve. So AMH is not the only kid on the block. There are other ones, um, along with a patient's history, medical history, gynecologic history, the male, any male factor. So it's part of this larger set of evaluation. That's what AMH is. Um, in, in terms of the research that was presented, that's where we have to also understand what is that, what is it telling us or what is it describing? And what I took away was this research is, is, is describing a, a larger uh, space. Uh, it's called the direct to consumer or direct to client um, sale of various medical products. It's not just for fertility. There's, there's many of these direct to client, direct to consumer products, which at, at a certain level um, are very empowering. And they really speak to the autonomy and they speak to freedom. The issue is how are they being interpreted? And I think that, and how are they being sold and marketed? And I think that's where the research really touches on. The research is not, is not questioning the utility of AMH. It's, it's questioning the interpretation of the AMH and how AMH should be presented to patients. Should it be presented uh, a priori to a visit with a fertility doctor or, or a, a naturopathic or some healthcare specialist? Um, or should it be held on to and only ordered once they've been evaluated for fertility issues? That, that's really where the question is. So in terms of my imp impression of the research, I have some concerns with the quality of the research. Um, I mean, it is coming from a reputable journal, JAMA, and the the researchers are, are definitely um, people that have performed research, are in programs that pump out research, but it is qualitative. You know, it's it's not it's not a randomized type of data. It, it's it's not looking at patient experience. It's, it's actually looking at it from a reviewer's experience. So, really, got to take it with a big grain of salt in terms of what that research is telling us, because it's it's not questioning the value of AMH. To me, it's really questioning how and when AMH should be presented to people. So, then, what is your thought on that? How and when, and is it? Is it valuable for someone to do an at-home test, and why? Or right. Why so not? I think I think the, the I think the and I and I, I do think the authors of the research presented it quite nicely. And they said the the two big concerns we have is allowing people to do this test without informed consent, and in in, in either falsely reassuring them that everything's okay when it may not be, or needlessly worrying them when things are actually okay. So. If you're the kind of person 
that won't over underinterpret your result, then it's a great test for you. But if that's going to lead to excess anxiety or false pacification of your fertility potential, then it's a problem. And and it does speak actually to this larger direct to consumer um, space that like we used to have. At least I can speak to gynecology and obstetrics where I'm involved with. Over the years, there have been many products that have been offered, and some of them have been. I would even argue toxic. Uh, you know, for example, patients can per- can purchase their own fetal monitoring kits at home, and, and they can pr- pr- uh, purchase their own ultrasounds. And patients have misinterpreted, overinterpreted, underinterpreted the state of their baby, made decisions, and then sure enough, um, have missed opportunity to intervene. Fortunately, with AMH, uh, again, I, I think if something's going on with someone's fertility, it'll be much larger than that one test. And, and even the, the, the marketers say that this is only part of uh, a larger group of testing. Uh, you know, it's ironic. This month is uh, PCOS Awareness Month, and I'm sure you're going to have so- shows on that. And so one of the claims of AMH is that it may predict someone's a, a risk of PCOS or PCOS likeliness. Again, I think that's flawed because we know PCOS is a much more complex condition that is composed of more than just one blood test. AMH is actually not part of the classic criteria for evaluation. So you can go down this rabbit hole of over and misinterpreting what these tests are for. Yeah, I think it's important to look at the bigger picture and look at all the criteria. I was just mentioning before you hopped on that uh, there are new PCOS guidelines, the guidelines in the US that just came out uh, this month where they include it as an alternative for younger women to do the AMH instead of the pelvic ultrasound as part of the Rotterdam criteria. So I thought that was kind of fascinating that they're including it now, but with the at-home tests, could you speak to maybe the idea that maybe the units might be different for the interpretation or if someone's perhaps like there's certain situations where their value might be not accurate, maybe they're on certain medications or certain like, you know, pregnancy status or whatever. Right, right. So, so many women uh, that are consuming this test, again, it depends on the population. Many of them might be on the birth control pill or other hormones um, that could falsely uh, cause interpretation. And, and you're right, units. Um, I would assume that these packages have indexes and guides to help people interpret it. But you're right, the two common units that we use, nanograms or picomoles, um, may be... Um, have different meaning, right? Like in one of the units, a low number is still acceptable, whereas in the picomole unit, uh, a low number is considered very, very, very low. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think that the direct to consumer market is available. There's obviously people that want it, but uh, I think that the counseling has to be there, limiting the claims. When I read the article, it's incredible the claims that are being made. Um, there's not one research body that has said that uh, AMH testing actually reliably on its own predicts someone's future fertility and reproductive destiny. Um, And when you read that, and then you look at some of the claims that are being placed against it for anywhere from 50 bucks to $200 or some of them were $250, money aside, I mean, it can be very scary. Uh, And then all of a sudden you're taking something like reproductive choices and fertility assessment and making it into an emergency when it may or may not. And I want to just pipe in here just for one brief moment, because you guys hit the nail on the head. And I just want to make it crystal clear for the audience about this. If you are actually on, let's say, a birth control pill or doing an IUD with hormones, you got to know that it will impact this AMH reading and it will not be accurate as to whether you are, you know, um, heading towards infertility or, you know, running out of eggs. Yes, Dr. Well, that's Well, that's not... It's not entirely true. The first part is definitely will, it may impact, but depending on what part of the register you're at. So women with high AMHs, um, whether they're on the birth control pill or not, or have a, a, a hormone, uh, by the way, the hormone releasing IUD should not impact it either way, but the birth control pill, uh, it may, but we find that at higher AMHs, the impact is very blunted. So it, so meaning if they come back with a high AMH, they probably really have a high AMH, even right, if they're on the pill. Right, of course, right. If they come back with a low AMH, we find that in lower register numbers, so let's say numbers that are below 10, below 5, the blunting effect of the pill can actually be exaggerated. So they actually probably have a much higher rate. So we've, even though you will read or meet 
providers that require patients to go off the birth control pill um, to do ovarian reserve testing, either because remember back to the ovarian reserve, it's we believe it's an ultrasound with an antral follicle count, a day three hormone panel, including an AMH blood test. Um, if the blood test comes back and they're on the pill and it's normal, then we don't. I don't worry. I don't worry that it's falsely elevated. If it comes back low, then I say to them, we may need to look at this again, or you may need to take a little pill holiday if you really want to pursue this. Um, we don't have an actual fudge factor, although there were some recent papers that have shown that you there are these nomograms for what happens when you're on the pill. So I actually don't tell patients to routinely stop the pill um, if they're coming in for a fertility. We even call it a fertility assessment. It's not really a fertility assessment. It's a uh, egg reserve evaluation. Uh, but um, uh, I, we, I don't routinely tell them to stop. I just take it with a grain of salt. So again, back to the at home versus going to a fertility clinic, because certainly now a lot of fertility clinics offer, let's just do a, do an evaluation. Where are you at in this moment? Because they are single, they're not ready to conceive, but just to get a baseline, you know, how do you, would you compare you know, at home versus going to a fertility clinic? Well, I mean, look, there's, there are some features that are, 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 are missing with the at home. The at home is a self-selection. You're choosing which components of fertility you're interested in, uh, and you're excluding areas that may have a lot of value. Uh, you, for example, just the history, someone talking to you and finding out what have you been through? What are your goals? What are your objectives? Right. So we don't, we don't capture any of that with the at-home direct testing. There may be, I, I'm not familiar with all 200 that they looked at. There may be some questionnaires that accompany them, but most of it is all do it yourself, right? That you don't get that piece. Um, the accuracy of the test, some of the, some of the groups that are offering these tests have pretty good accuracy. So they're, they're actually reputable. Like, you know, some of them are life labs and, 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 you know, they're a very reputable lab. The fact that you're, some of them require you to get a, an actual prick test. Uh, to go into a lab to do it. So, I mean, the, the actual mode of getting may not be comfortable for some people. Um, but I think what you get when you go to a clinic is you get the ultrasound, um, you get the conversation, you get the color commentary that may be unique to your specific case. You get that patient-centeredness. And at least in our jurisdiction, you're entitled to it. And it can be done, you know, we talk about how convenient the um, direct-to-consumer AMH test is. But now in this post-COVID era, I meet all my patients online anyway, so it's direct to consumer regardless. It's at home. Um, unfortunately, there may be a bit of a wait, uh, but there now are popping up these clinics that are offering a sort of a fast track for uh, egg freezing evaluation, uh, and they would ser- and they would provide that service. So I am a firm believer in patient autonomy and patient choice, but I'm also a firm believer in informed consent. And, and I think that there may not be the depth of information that either Mary um, Tanya or myself could provide uh, through a meeting. We're human. We're humans. Like we like interacting. Yes, we want to. We want to. So. Yes, the like, robots are touch. not taking over. <laughs> yeah, we want to. We want to touch each other in a, yeah. in a meaningful way. And you know what? Part of this hormones aside, like there are many women that are great candidates for egg reserve testing that are just not ready to do that. And there are some women that are terrible candidates or less than optimal candidates that are very keen to do it. And the direct home test is not going to capture all of that. Right. I think it's like a genetic, it should be treated like a genetic test, like where you're testing for the BRCA1, 2, and then you have a conversation with somebody about your results, right? Like it should be, or, you know, you, you know, you have that, well, maybe not protected, but ideally you would take that information and go to speak to somebody who knows about AMH so that you're not scared into thinking, oh my goodness, my reserve is so low. Am I going to go into menopause early? Or uh, am I going to have enough if I want to freeze eggs? Or, you know, oh, do I have PCOS? My reserve is so high, right? So you have to have that conversation. Well, that, that, so the test, the, the, that, the study, the, the research study, which referred to as a qualitative study, uh, it, it was looking at many, many, many different platforms, like maybe the same AMH testing, but I don't know how they were all packaged. Some of them may have had some of that counseling that you described. It's not very oh, okay. clear. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, again, when you unleash a patient on the internet, on Google, and they mm-hmm. can search on them, how are they even able to assess? Is is a $245 platform test better than a $45 one or a $100 one? Like, what is the, what is, does price equal uh, efficacy? 
Uh, there were even some claims that uh, the AMH was evaluating the delayed onset of male puberty. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, we've asked these research questions of the, the AMH in, in the male uh, uh, space, but this is not ready for prime time. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know if all those questions can be answered. And certainly the menopause question uh, uh, is, is a, a really tough one as well. Intuitively, you think lower AMH, you're, you're closer to menopause. But what if you always started with a lower AMH? There's no, unless you do, unless you do multiple rounds of this direct to consumer at your own expense testing, uh, which is another issue, you keep paying for more of them, right? You won't know the trajectory of your AMH. Maybe you were just born with a lower reserve and it'll just sit there for a while. We Thank don't you know. for addressing that because I think that's a very critical piece because as you say, some people just naturally have that and it doesn't mean that they're out of anything and that they're going to be fearful of, oh my gosh, my egg quality suck, right? You know, right from the get go. Well, thank you for, thank you for inviting me by the way, because I, I just got jumped. I, I was very um, flustered with the, the tech here. So I'm so sorry about that. Oh. I, I made, it seemed like I was late for this when I actually was ahead of schedule, but, but thank you for incorporating me in this conversation. Uh, because it is so timely. Uh, and as we launch off this PCOS Awareness Month, I, I think it just opens up other conversations about AMH that are are really important to have. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And and you'll notice that Tang is actually wearing some teal go color going on. <laughs> today is the, <laughs> In honor. Yes, today teal, is like PCOS wait. Awareness, uh, like the National yeah. PCOS Awareness Day, right? Yes. Great. So thank more. you. Like mm -hmm. we always love having you on. And you know, guys, if you haven't all done so already, My Fertology is our podcast. You can either consume it, you know, auditory, or you can actually watch our YouTube videos. And Dr. Barat was not only, you know, obviously he's here right now with us, so you could w review and watch this on My Fertology later next week. But he was also on episode sixty-eight, when we were talking about natural frozen embryo transfers. And then episode 21, we talked about does IVF cause early menopause? So all relevant conversations. So we have like a ton of resources for you that are relevant no matter what age, no matter what stage of the life you're in. So check it out. Anything else we need to add in there? Oh, well, obviously you got to like and subscribe and definitely share with everybody that you know, because this is such a valuable information. And again, we honor you for being with us again and again, Dr. Bratz, because your contribution makes such an impact and we love hearing your insights from your professional and uh, personal experience with all this. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think there's a lot of thank yous going on here. But I, I, <laughs> it's uh, a lot of love. They, well, what I will say is, you know, what patients, the counter that many patients would have to our talk is they say, okay, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, what are the actual resources? How do I get in with Mary or Tanya or Dr. Bratz or whatever? So uh, I would say you can always engage your family doctor or your practitioner. You can always request, meaning if you're the kind of person that's worried, that alone could be reason for consultation. So you're entitled to that consultation and that, that would be a virtual one. Um, and, and finally, there are many online resources that could direct you to how to interpret these direct-to-consumer tools. So using things like Fertility Matters Canada, um, using the Society of OBGYNs of Canada, using the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society or the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. They all have provider and consumer arms to their websites and they have very specific uh, how to interpret ovarian test literature free of charge. You don't have to pay for any of that. And then you can see, does it fit you uh, and how to interpret that and where are some of the gaps of some of these tests. So I'm not trying to to knock the DTC space. I'm just saying it needs to be put up against all those other uh, influences. So for all that, we're going to give you links on my fertology when the podcast comes out. And then on top of that, and if you guys are like, you know what, I don't have that kind of time, just call us at Alive Holistic Health or reach Dr. Barat at Create Fertility Center. Okay. So must run away, guys. Have a great day. Happy, Thank you happy, so much. Well, happy long weekend. Happy yes, long weekend. You too. you too. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks. Good.